guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show, sponsored by Arnold Clark. Happy New Year to you. We are back with you for 2021. I'm Peter Martin, Alan Ruff, Tam McManus and Alison McConnell here with us on this Monday. Is the league over? What next for Neil Lennon? Is Tommy Wright the ideal candidate to take over at Motherwell? Just a few of the questions we'll be discussing and looking back over the weekend's fixtures from the 2nd of January. We'll also look at the head-to-head, -head, which has taken a dramatic twist since we were last on the programme. But I'm delighted to say Tam, Alison and Ruffy are with me. Ruffy, uh, looking a little bit frail. We were worried about you not being with us on the 2nd of January, but you, you're getting back to full fitness. Yeah, certainly are. Uh, wasn't particularly well for 14 days. Uh, just to let you know how how unwell I was. Uh, I haven't had a drink for 14 days, so it just shows you, you know, there's something you've got to put up with. But oh, uh, you know, uh, getting back. Uh, but it's obviously a long way to go yet. But no, I'm happy uh, now. You can appreciate, you know, what some people have been going through. Uh, but no, nope, no, nope, back there they go. Yep, absolutely. Great to see you, Ruffy. Um, obviously, Tam owes me a tenner. He didn't think you were going to make it, but you are back with us. So that's absolutely fantastic, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. Um, OK, let's get into the meat and bones of things. Thank you very much to so many people. Aileen, Hugh McElraith, Stuart, Derek, Alec Kelly, Ronnie Chapman, Gordon McFadgen, Jim Dolan, William Campbell, Paul Baird, lots of people. David Robertson, who's in Newcastle, no doubt. Um, Sandy Grant, Callum Dillery, Darren Hope, Ronnie Porter. So many people joining us on our Facebook. You can like, share and follow. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can uh, follow us at PLZ Soccer on Twitter for the programme. Thank you to so many. Robert Monroe as well as Kathleen Madden. Uh, people saying Happy New Year and we're delighted that you could join us uh, to reflect on the weekend. The big game at Ended Rangers 1 Celtic nil. I might as well start you off with a few little things just to get your blood boiling, get you going. But the league is all over. It's a coronation for Rangers. In my mind, that 1-0 victory sends them 19 points clear. There's no way back now. Steven Gerrard and the team have got a couple of days off. And then, uh, as he puts it, the league starts for them now, Ruffy, just to try and make sure that they try and get it as early as possible. Yeah, I think that would be, uh, obviously, the, the everybody at Ibrox would be more than happy with what happened at the weekend. You obviously know I don't fall into your camp at uh, throwing the towel in when there's so many things still to go. Uh, at 19 points, it looks uh, irretrievable. Uh, it remains to be seen at the, the end of January. I mean, that, they fixtures are out the road. And if it was then still 19 points, I would have to uh, probably jump into the bandwagon. But for me, 57 points still to play for. And I know Rangers are so far ahead. Uh, it's a difficult one to defend, but as a footballer, you don't want to throw in the towel, you know. And I hope Celtic don't throw in the towel because, for us, you know, to talk about football for the next five months, if it's going to be that way, it's going to be a long, long end to the season. So, I think there's something. I hope there's something edge to something that we can hang hang on to and keep us going for. Yeah, I uh, love you to death, Ruffy. You know that. Our friendship will never be affected. But clearly, uh, the medication that you're on at the <laughs> moment is really affecting you. And I think a lot Elodemol. of people... Well, people are actually... <laughs> yes, you're right, Tom. People, people are, are wishing him well and, and asking him to up the dosage. It's as simple as that. Um, uh, Ali, uh, all I would suggest to you right now is it's going to be a long, slow painful end to the season for Celtic fans uh, because, quite simply, they're not going to be able to claw 19 points back. Let's be realistic. Listen, I think it's over in an all-but name. Uh, all that Celtic can do now is is try and ask a question and, and see how Rangers respond to, to going under a little bit of pressure if they can if they can win their, their three games in hand and then go on a, a run of consistency and just see where it takes them. But on the evidence of the opening half of the campaign, I'm not entirely sure that that would be a given in itself. But also, to the converse of that is when you look at how Rangers have played up until this stage, I think they would only be two points off of Brendan Rodgers' invincibles at a similar stage of the season. They do not look like a team who are going to falter. In it. And I think for the majority of us looking at the league table, I think, yes, there's an acceptance 
that the title race is, is over and done with. I think if Celtic had to had to do anything, it had to be at the weekend and it had to be a win. I don't even think that a point would have been sufficient to keep them on the tail. So I think it's a big, big ask now. But if you're in Celtic's camp, the only thing you would suggest is that you try and put a bit of pressure on and see how Rangers cope being in position. But even then, I would think it would be quite a, a forlorn hope, to be honest with you. Yeah, well, I think they're hanging on to a thread on this one, Tam, on the basis that some Celtic fans have said, you know, they played Rangers off the park. Well, I could recount, you know, thousands of old firm games where one team has been the dominant force and the other team has won it. You only have to look back to the League Cup final uh, where Rangers were so dominant and Celtic produced a, a Dick Turpin performance in stealing a result. So um, at the end of the day, Celtic played well, Rangers won the match. Mm. There's, it's always the result that counts, Peter, in an old firm game, in any game of football. The result, it's the result that matters, and the Rangers got the three points, a massive three points. I think that takes any sort of, you know, Celtic win the league out of the equation. I think Rangers will win the league, and they'll win the league handsomely. I think they won it by 15 to 20 points. Um, I thought that Celtic had to win the game, just to give, see, just to see if Rangers got a little bit jittery. I don't think they have. Um, you know, they, they, they stayed in the game in the first half. The goalkeeper, I think Alan McGregor, was outstanding. Kept them in the game at times, and uh, they got a little bit fortunate with the goal. But it's the result that matters. And as you said, listen, Celtic fans have seen this movie, I think, hundreds of times, particularly in the nineties. You know, when Tommy Burns' teams would batter Rangers, and Andy Gorham would keep them in the game, and then they would go up the part and score. I think it was similar uh, at the game at the weekend there. And uh, I think Celtic fans at half time kind of knew it was coming because Celtic were so dominant, but they hadn't scored. And they hadn't went ahead in the game, and uh, I think they knew that the right was on the ball when Rangers scored. And I think they send an off Peter changes the game. I think it was a red card. I, th- I think they probably got into that, but I think that changes the whole game. I think Celtic. I think they would have only won the game. I think they were the dominant team in the game. I think they would have only won the game. But the sending off changes everything, and it gives Rangers that little bit of edge. And they took their opportunity and defended well to see the game out. Yeah, well, no surprise, Stephen Gerrard not getting carried away. Listen, the players deserve to enjoy tonight. It's, it's another derby win. That's two out of two this season. Um, we'll give them a day or two off now to, to spend with the families. They've really sacrificed themselves um, over Christmas. But it's about resetting uh, midweek once we start our work towards Aberdeen. And there's 48 points to play for. Um, no one will be getting carried away. We'll keep our feet on the ground. And the league starts now for us. We need to really reset that and, and, and really go and do what we need to do to try and get another positive result at Aberdeen. Profi, I've got a big question to ask you. You're a goalkeeper. You're a goalkeeper of some standing in your day. Um, there's a goalkeeper for Rangers that I thought was absolutely top drawer at the weekend. He produced one world-class save. I'm going to show you a group of stats, and you're going to have to tell me whether you think it's McGregor or Gorham, the best goalkeeper. Have a look at this, Rafi. Al McGregor made two world-class saves to ensure Rangers won Saturday's old firm, and if they do go on to win the league, so much of it will be down to his performances. But how does he compare to the Jers' greatest ever keeper, Andy Gorham? The two goalies spent the majority of their careers at Ibrox. McGregor first broke into the team in 2006, but left as the club were demoted before returning three years ago. Gorham joined in 1991 and stayed for seven seasons. He formed the backbone of the record equaling nine in a row side. McGregor's made 402 appearances and is the club's record European appearance holder, whilst Gorham turned out 260 times. McGregor has lifted the title on three occasions, most recently in 2011, when his penalty save from Georgia Samras in a decisive old firm sent the Jers on their way. However, Gorham has six titles and his often one-man heroic performances to deny Celtic victories led Tommy Burns to brand him as the man who broke his heart. McGregor has been more successful in cup competitions, though. He's lifted the Scottish Cup three times and a League Cup five, whilst Gorham has just won five between the two of them. The debate will rage on between arguably the two greatest ever Rangers keepers, and perhaps a title this season would sway the argument in McGregor's favour. Ruffy, where's your money? Wow, wow, we got half an hour to talk about the two of them. Uh, <laughs> Jesus heavens, you know, the two of them, I, I can't say, I, I would struggle to separate either the two of them. Both of them have got equal qualities. Uh, we keep talking about uh, you know goalkeepers who don't make saves. Uh, they certainly make saves. They make big saves. They make important saves. They make winning saves. That's what makes them so good. I mean, every goalkeeper will make good saves, but to make the saves that they made, and, and McGregor did it at the weekend there, Andy Gorham did it as well. If you Honestly, if you were to really, really push me on it, I would just maybe give it to Andy. You know, I, I think some of the saves that uh, he did at the top of 
the European games and, and obviously league games. But every time I say something, you could say the same for Alan McGregor. He's done it. It's a really tough one to split the both of them. Uh, it wouldn't be by much because I think the two of them are the best two uh, that Rangers have had. Yeah, and all the years that you've worked with me, Robbie, I don't think we've had Jesus Heavens as uh, uh, your statement, but you've, you've managed to sneak that in as well. I probably would just, just give it to Gorham as well. I, I thought he was a fantastic shot stopper, Tom. Yeah, I think it's a very difficult one. Uh, I think Ruffy's right. Both of them have got equal qualities. And I think Andy Gorham, possibly a better shot stopper. Uh, you know, you look at the amount of games that he won for Rangers, particularly old firm games where... He was a standout performer, you know, three, four, five world-class saves and Rangers would go and win the game. So um, it's very difficult. I think if Alan McGregor, I think Rangers won the league this season. If McGregor gets his fourth league title, then I think you'd maybe just shade it for him. But as Ruffy said, the two best goalkeepers that Rangers have ever had and Alan McGregor will go down as a Rangers legend alongside Andy Gorham. Yeah, um, the positives for uh, Rangers in this one, even without Ryan Jack and Scott Arfield, um, they were able to ride out the storm and then, albeit McGregor scored an OG, um, but they were able to ride out the storm and get the win they needed. Um, there were a few controversial moments in the game. Um, Tam says he thought it was a red card. I thought it was. Alison, did you think Beaton deserved to go or did you think Ayer was there with enough cover? I thought it was a red card. I don't think you can... It was a rugby tackle. I think Ayer was too far away. I don't think he was ever getting over to cover it. I do think it was a red card, and I think it changed the complexion of the game in, in, entirely. I think you could feel the, the nervousness about Celtic once he, he went off. I, and I just think it was, a, it was a foolish moment in the game, but it's also symptomatic of what happens when you're not a centre center half and you're playing in that position without truly knowing the role. Uh, and I think it was a, a midfielder's challenge almost that, that proved particularly costly. And the very fact that you're deploying a player like that in his centre half maybe just points to the, the problems that have beset Celtic throughout the course of this campaign. I think they really needed a couple of dominant centre halves to come in, in in the summer. I think we all anticipated that when Shane Duffy was coming, that he would be the answer to that problem, it's quite clear that it's not materialised like that. And the very fact that before the game, when, when Neil Lennon is saying that Christopher Julian's out now for at least three or four months and Shane Duffy was still not starting the game, I think then you can draw your own conclusion from that about the the way he's he's performed at Celtic so far. But I think um, beating, beating being deployed in that position itself just tells you the, the story of Celtic season and it's a, a problem of recruitment and a problem of, of continual pr problems that have repeated themselves on a loop. Yeah, the manager hinted he might be looking at a winger um, based on, you know, Forrest and maybe having another option, Tam. So he's now looking at a central defender as well. I don't know why he's keeping Shane Duffy. Um, I think he, mm. he should say to Shane Duffy, just go back to Brighton. But also, I don't know if the manager... Um, is going to be in the job. There's surely a discussion to be taking place shortly. I mean, we've already got the debacle of people wanting to criticise Celtic's trip to Dubai because somebody's taken a photograph of them having a beer. I mean, I just, I don't get involved in all that. If if Celtic had won the game, won nothing, they would have been happy seeing them popping champagne corks over in, du in Dubai. I don't, I don't think Celtic should have gone to Dubai, but that's a separate issue, Tam. I, I wonder about the manager's future. Do you? Yeah, I do, Peter. I think that it was a game that Neil Lennon had to win. I don't think you can blame Neil Lennon for the result. I think he played a very positive team. I think he played the team that most Celtic fans wanted. You know, he played Ismael Sorrow in there. He played Turnbull. He had energy in the middle of the park. He played two strikers. So I think the Celtic fans were delighted when they seen the team coming out. It was a team that most of them would have picked. So I think Celtic were the better team on the day. But the result was everything. And Rangers, and Rangers won the game. So that piles yet more pressure on Neil Lennon. You know, is it a situation now where you give Neil Lennon at the end of the season. I don't think Neil Lennon, if, if they go to the end of the season, he'll be the manager next season. So is, is he just keeping the chair, the chair warm for someone else? Or is it a situation where you go, listen, it's time to cut ties with Neil and it's time to bring someone else in with a view to next season, with a view to looking at the, the players that Celtic have got just now and, and seeing who he wants for next season and going into the transfer market. So it's a big decision for the Celtic board, but I always felt that they were going to give him to this game. Um, but I, I felt it was a game that Celtic had to win. And Celtic haven't won it, they lost the game. So I think the, the board have got a huge decision to make now for in terms of going next season. I think this season's yeah. done. Obviously, Scottish Cup's still to play for, Peter, but I think the league's gone. So it's, it's, it's looking to head to next season because Rangers will be just as strong next year, I think. 
Yeah, well, Gordon McFadgen has said on Facebook that he says, Tam, the manager carries the can. Um, and, and I think, Gordon, you, you make a very good point on this. Um, it's something that we mentioned, uh, Ruffy, right back at the start of the season. Um, uh, it was a season when I called it the most poisonous season of all because of the fixation with 10, because of the desperation to either win it or stop it. Um, and I think we mentioned back in August that Whoever is not out in front in December, will, there will be calls for them to be sacked. Um, now you've got a situation, even the manager, Neil Lennon, um, I don't think he's even conceding that the title is over just yet. No, oh, I think he's a football manager of the club. He's got the responsibility to supporters. Uh, they keep fighting away and he's not going to throw it in. Even Stephen Gerrard isn't going to say that they've won it either. That's the way football is. Uh, I think we sat here six weeks ago and said, right, Neil Lennon's got seven games to prove to everybody that these players want to play for him. He needs some kind of show. Uh, I think he got that. I think six wins out of seven. I think they only lost about two goals in, in that space of time. So the improvement was there. The disappointment of the weekend is there for everybody to see. So it's up to the owners to say, right, well, there was some kind of improvement. We're ass so far behind. Do we do it now or do we do it at the end of the season? Uh, I think there's still a lot to play for. I think the end of the season would give them time uh, if they are of a mind to change to get somebody in place. I don't think there is anybody in place just now. I think that's another massive problem. There's nobody jumping out and, and hitting you smack in the face and saying, yeah, he's the one. So, you know, I, I think it's still game by game, you know, that uh, he'll still want to see some improvement in the in the side, uh, kicking on for the weekend's performance, obviously not the result, but uh, there's three big games coming up, there's three home games coming up for Celtic there's three away games coming up for Rangers that's why I, I maybe said let's wait until the end of January because 19 points is horrendous 10 and 8 points you maybe could deal with, you know, so still a long way to go for me, but Rangers are in the, the driving seat and, and Stephen Gerrard's team is the only ones that can throw this away Mm, here's Celtic manager Neil Lennon. I mean, you can't say that, you know, and I thought there was a lot of anxiety out there today when, you know, we had control of the game. So it may be a pivotal moment in the season. You know, I can't sort of predict what's going to happen in the second half of the season. But, um, you know, what we have to do is keep playing like that, keep being consistent and um, winning games and just try and keep as much pressure on the rest as we possibly can. Yep, um, you can give us your view on it. Uh, is it time to look for a new manager? Is there one screaming at you right now that you think is the ideal candidate? Ruffy thinks not. I mean, that's the that's the key element here, Alison. It's all right, people shouting for the manager to be replaced, but who's out there that you think can come in uh, and do a job and get the backing of the board to, to transform it and change it? Well, this was a, a conversation that was always going to come up. I think the, the board had said last month that they would review the, the manager's position again once he got to January. So it's, it's not come as any great surprise to anyone, but I think there are questions to be asked and, and decisions to be made now in terms of between now and the end of the season and then going forward in the, the long term, what's going to happen. And it's it, it's interesting too, because we're in the a new transfer window. Who, who Who's going to have control over who comes in or who may go? Are you going to want to sanction transfers? If you're thinking about changing the manager, it's a, it's a very, very difficult one. And I think you need to have some clarity and you need to have an idea in your mind about where you want to go in the direction that you want to go in. Yeah, all these questions uh, to answer with regards to Neil Lennon. Um, for Rangers fans, um, apart from the fact that uh, so many of the Rangers fans are delighted, they're looking at the title uh, in the distance now and thinking as well, within touching distance, 19 points, Tom. Um, they're speculating as to when Rangers could win that title. April 17 seems to be uh, a key date. I actually think they might win it before April 17th. Yeah, listen, I know Celtic have got three games in hand, but there's absolutely no guarantee that they're going to win those three games. Um, you know, they've been in poor form, I think, all season. There's been a little bit of an improvement over the last three or four league games uh, from a Celtic point of view, but still nowhere near the levels that they should be at to go and win the league and be confident and win every single game. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree. They've got a tough game coming up, I was going to say, against Hibs, but Hibs have been really poorly uh, lately in the last couple of games. But they've got an opportunity, you know, the first game that they can come back and get some, some points on the board against Hibs at home and then try and drive it on from there. But 
I just can't see Celtic winning every game. And then you're looking at, what, 19 points, and then probably the goal difference is 20 points. Feeling the Rangers maybe having to lose four games and Celtic winning every game. I just, it's a big, big ask. And Celtic, uh, Rangers would need to really, really bottle it big time uh, to lose the league from here, for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, um, give us your thoughts on that, Rangers fans, Celtic fans, uh, Rangers fans. Um, already, I mean, I've listened to a couple of pundits, roughly suggesting that uh, Stephen Gerrard is the Liverpool manager in waiting. Um, now, it's a, bit, it's a bit early for that. I mean, he's still, to, he's still to get the success he craves at Rangers, roughly. And I've got pundits shouting that he's going to be the replacement for Klopp. And I don't know about you, Ruffy, but Klopp looks as if he could be at Liverpool for the next four or five years. Yeah, I think if Klopp was to leave Liverpool, it would have to be for somebody like a Barcelona or something like that. You know, I think he's he's even at Liverpool just now is absolutely fantastic. Why would you want to leave that? You know, I can see where people come from because Liverpool are that kind of club that they they promote from within, and him being the legend there, but he's not winning yet. You know, he's not done in. You know, let, let, let's wait until May uh, and see if he's got a Scottish Cup and see if he's got a league win and see if he's got a. a a semi-final of a European uh, competition under his belt. And these are the kind of things that would then make big clubs stand up and take count of what he's done. But for, for me, and I'm sure, although it's very, very positive just now, there's nothing been won yet. Yeah, absolutely. Brian Haig um, has thrown another uh, twist in this little tale. He says Gerard is clearly uh, the next Hearts manager in waiting. Um, Brian, <laughs> I, know, I know the kind of game you're up to and I quite like it. Uh, I quite like the noise up. We deal with noise ups on here. Um, Andy Wilson, who's in Australia, says John Barnes for Celtic. Um, yep, that's the nature of it. I mean, the one thing about it that I, I thoroughly enjoy at times... Um, Tom, um, you know, we can talk about all the negatives that social media um, has, and there are many, uh, and there are lots of people that leave a lot to be desired in the way they were brought up, but there's a lot of good banter out there, and if, I, it, you know, if there was nine years of Celtic um, giving it tight to the Rangers <clears> fans, <throat> um, they're going to have to suck it up because the banter is good from people who know exactly what um, humour is all about. Yeah, I've said this many times on the show, Peter. You know, the Celtic fans have had it all their own way, particularly the last four years, you know, winning every single trophy, you know, available. And the Rangers fans have had to suck it up, you know, and take and take the hits from their pals, from, from social media, from Twitter, Facebook, their mates at work. So the, the shoe's on the other foot now, and I've got absolutely no problem with it. As long as they keep it, you know, as, as a bit of banter and it doesn't stray over into sectarian stuff and other, other, other nonsense, you know, go and have a go back at your mates. You know, my brother-in-law's a Rangers fan, and that's the first time I've heard from him. In about four years after the game, uh, the weekend. <laughs> so listen, that, that's that's the way it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be. You're going to come out. You're going to give a bit of banter because Rangers are on top now. Rangers are the dominant force uh, between the two at the minute, and uh, you've got to take the you've got to take your hits. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Ruffy, to be fair, that's tomorrow's headline in the newspapers. Tam speaks to brother-in-law shock. I mean, that is outrageous. I mean, honestly, I mean, why would you break? I thought he was my number the phone. Yet? <laughs> why would you answer the phone, Tam? Close the curtains. I know. <laughs> Don't speak well, I thought it'd be Tam finds a brother-in-law. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic anyway apart from anything else uh, that's the joy of the Old Firm game and the aftermath of it um, I think um, as I've said long before the Old Firm game I think uh, Celtic's chance of winning the league uh, slim to none I thought the league was over a few weeks back but you might think differently you might share Ruffy's view and we can all have the probabilities and the mathematically uh, possible arguments but um, when you look at it 19 points it would be the biggest collapse in football history, I think, uh, was one of the headlines I read in the papers uh, this morning. So we can't see it, can you? It's all about opinions. Uh, let's have a look at the Scottish Premiership results over the weekend because um, there was more misery for Tam. Uh, certainly, it was a shocker in the predictors, let me tell you. Rangers got the win. Aberdeen, Dundee United was a snore fest. Uh, Hamilton spanking Motherwell and Motherwell manager listen Keith Lasley in the caretaker role not happy with what he witnessed uh, Hibbs 
I mean, absolutely spanked <laughs> by by Livingston, uh, you know. And I have to tell you, if you ever get a chance to hear the co-commentator on that match on his <laughs> television, it is absolute comedy gold. I actually thought he might have jumped off the top of the gantry. Um, Kelly and St Mirren and Ross County and St Johnston uh, uh, shared the draw on this. So um, I was was I was watching me me me, me Tam the commentator. I was watching him for Rangers TV. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, honest. I mean, I don't think anybody predicted it, Tom. What's happened? The back end has fallen out of it for you guys. Oh, the last two games, Peter Hibbs have been atrocious. I mean, I don't know where it came from because they got a lot of plaudits for their performance at Ibrox. I felt they're a little bit unlucky not, not to get something out of the game. But the last two games, Ross County and Livingston, two games where you would think, you know, Hibbs could pick up six points. They have been trounced in every department and it's been really worrying. So, you know, the, the boys get a rest, I think, nine days. I don't think they play Celtic until next Monday, a week today. So they get nine days. I think they'll, they'll rest a couple of them, try and bring a couple of players in. I think Chris Cadden's been rumoured uh, to become the Hibs, which I think would be a great signing. So they need a, a few fresh faces in there just to strengthen the squad because Jack Ross has been going with the same 11, 12, 13 players over the Christmas period and some of them look, look knackered, to be honest. So I think the rest will do them good and hopefully you'll see a better performance against Celtic next Monday. Uh, I mean, the back line, Ruffy, was murder. The goal they conceded was yeah. route one. The third one was just, it was embarrassing. Yeah, yeah I, th I think we've been talking up Porteous and Hanlon too much for Scotland call-ups. I think it's very evident in these last two or three games that they're not the quality to play in a Scotland full squad. Not yet, maybe in a, a year or two, but uh, obviously Tam's pal Marciano is not there either. Maybe he is now a big, big player in that side, uh, making the saves that you... Yeah, you have to wait because the boy that was in didn't look impressive. I see he's a wee back to uh, Queen's Park Rangers. But, uh, you know, it, it's a strange one. I think everybody that would, when saw the scores coming out uh, at the weekend there must have been scratching their head, particularly at Hibs. But all credit to, to Livy. I just can't get my head around, you know, what's happened there. Um, the young boy, the boy Scott Robertson's come in and he looks like a world beater every time mm. he touches the ball. You know, it's hitting the back of the net and it just shows you how we tweaks here and there, uh, but Livy for me, I, I just, I, I'm just astounded the where, where they have been in the last four or five games. Yeah, I mean, full marks to David Martindale and the team. They've certainly produced the performances since Gary Holt's departure. Uh, as far as Hibbs is concerned, Neil Gray says, I hope Hibbs' poor performances carry on until after the League Cup semi-final uh, against uh, St Johnston. So clearly, you know where Neil's uh, colours are firmly. Uh, pinned. Uh, as far as uh, Hibs are concerned, well, they're going to have to try and get back on track uh, against Celtic. That's their next game, which I presume they need like a hole in the head. But full marks to uh, Livingston. If you're a Livy fan out there, you must be absolutely delighted with what you're watching. If you're a Motherwell fan, um, you must be actually shaking your head. I mean, Alison, I tip Motherwell to be top three at the start of the season. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Stephen <laughs> Robinson. get relegated. That could be the best position ever. Steve, Steve, I know, exactly. <laughs> Stephen Robinson's chucked it, Alison. I don't know what's happened. The back line concedes goals willy nilly. This is with a Scotland internationalist. And they just seem to have completely and utterly lost it. I was actually at Hamilton on Saturday and I was shocked at the, the Motherwell performance. I think Trevor Carson's absence has been huge for them. I thought the goalkeeper looked entirely unconvincing throughout the game. I think the, the first goal that you lost just set the tone for the afternoon. They look like a team who are in free fall at the minute. There, there was just so little about them. They had a couple of half chances towards the, the end of the game. But in some ways, I do feel for them. I wonder what the impact has been about the, the whole COVID investigation and the, the six points that they had and then the six points that they lost, that they're, they're still waiting to see what the outcome of the appeal will be because that obviously would change the complexion of the league table. But I think it would leave them maybe one win off a, a top six place. If it stays as it is, then they're very, very firmly in that relegation mire now. I think Ross County ahead only on goal difference. But... In terms of the actual performance, they deserve to be where they are just now. It's been dreadfully poor, dreadfully. And I, and I just wonder, again, we're, we're talking about managerial futures, whether Keith Lasley's a voice that's been in there quite a bit and obviously is, is, is in with the bricks at, at Motherwell. But he made a very, very telling comment for me in the aftermath of the game when he spoke about that there were still some players in the dressing room who, who had the club's interests at heart. And... 
as a journalist, for me, the obvious question there was, well, where are the ones and who are the guys who don't? Because it's certainly reflective in, in the way that they're playing just now. Yeah, you have a look at the candidates that are being tipped. I mean, obviously, Keith Lasley is clearly, when you look at the odds here on the next manager, he's in there, but a clear favourite. And I think it would be a great signing. I'm a huge fan of Tommy Wright, um, Tom. I just think he's mm. got, he's got uh, you know, great wealth of experience and he would be the ideal man, a thoroughly decent man. I think he would be the ideal man to steady the ship at Motherwell. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's surprising that Tommy's not get back in somewhere at the minute. I think he's he's surely had offers. The job he done at St Johnson was incredible. You know, won the Scottish Cup with them. They're in the top six most years. You know, I think he walked away at the right time. I think uh, I think they'd maybe the players had enough of him. He'd enough of the players and the same voice every day. But I think in terms of Motherwell, Motherwell need to bring a, someone in who keep him up this season. You know, that, that's as simple as that. I was listening to Tom Cowan uh, the weekend, and he said the same. Mother will need a manager in who's going to get the players get into shape and, and keep them in the division because as Alison said there, you know, if they don't get these six points, they are firmly in the in the relegation mire and they're down there with Hamilton Hackies who look as if they're going to do it again this season. You know, they're shouting for Brian Rice's head. You know, they were bottom of the league, a wee bit detached and they've all of a sudden they've hit form. And they do it every year. So if Mother will are, are coming up against battle hardened teams down there, uh, you'd, you'd, you'd fear for them. So I think Tommy Wright is Perfect eh, for Malo. Yeah, okay. Uh, this next part, because obviously, um, as ever, um, we have a, a program that goes out and news comes in and we react to news um, and we react to events surrounding football on the park and off the park. The, the couple of things have, have uh, just come in that I'm, I'm obviously going to get your reaction to. The second one, I think, will light the touch paper, but nevertheless, um, the Joint Response Group has mentioned there was uncertainty around sports like football and whether teams in the four SPFL divisions, as well as the likes of the Highland League, will be allowed to continue. This is off the back of Nicola Sturgeon's comments, which put us effectively into a lockdown again, uh, similar to March, uh, where she's advising um, everyone to stay at home, unless, of course, there is an absolute necessity um, that you can't do something uh, from working from home. Um, so, sides from the Championship to the Juniors are set to obviously play in the Scottish Cup second round this weekend. There's Premiership fixtures, including, of course, Aberdeen against Rangers. The Scottish Government's official guidance suggests full-time sides, at the very least, will be allowed to continue, stating an exception will be made for those in professional sports for training, coaching and competing in an event. Um, so I, I think there's no doubt they're going to speak to the sports minister on this, Rafi, to make sure they're completely clear about what's happening now with this new lockdown. Yeah, I think with the, the new virus strain that's out there, I think uh, people are getting very, very anxious. Of, is this going to be another march? Uh, I particularly don't think we're too far away from the SPFL or the SFA throwing out another dossier or a decision, a vote, to see where we're going. I think they need to cover themselves. It's getting to a very important part of the the season. We saw what happened last year when uh, we, we couldn't decide on when to finish the season or, or whatever. So I, I think there's another vote, maybe four or five weeks, depending on the pandemic, obviously. But I, I think something has to be done in right writing. We, we need to have something concrete uh, so that everybody knows exactly how many games you've played, whether we're going to carry on, whether we're going to chuck it or whatever, because, you know, it seems to be pretty bad at this moment in time. You just have to look at down in England at the weekend there. There was three or four games just, just cancelled, you know, and if that was to multiply, then uh, we're being in a, a serious situation. I hope it's not the case. I really don't. Because if you just said earlier on, if everybody, you know, adheres to, you know, what we've been told to do, we shouldn't have these problems. But again, the vaccine was the one we all depended on to get. It's there now. So the sooner that comes, the better. And it might just save everybody. Well, I think, Alison, to be perfectly honest with you, that's the difference between now and March. You know, Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister, is talking about the race that she has between, you know, uh, the increase in this new variant uh, and people that are getting infected and the race to get the vaccine out as quickly as she possibly can. And I think that's the difference um, between now and March. Whether that proves to be the difference, as Ruffy mentioned there, in uh, you know the board of the SPFL having to 
changed their stance on possible calling leagues. I, I, I'm not. I'm not so sure that that will be the same this season. I might be wrong, Alison. I don't know what your take on it is. I tend to agree with you. I think the vaccine changes the complexion of it a little bit. However, what I will say is that football will be under intense scrutiny now. Over the next few weeks, you are going to have to adhere to every single protocol. I think the the, the smallest slip would, would give the authorities the, the perfect excuse to say, we're closing it down. Again, we're going to put it on hold again. I think, uh, I think it will have to be very, very stringent. I think it calls into question again Celtic's trip to Dubai. I think it was ill-advised in the current climate, and I don't mean as though that's anything to do with the, the result at the weekend or, or where they are in a football sense, but I think in the middle of a global pandemic, I, I don't think the optics look good at all when you're travelling to something that's that's not essential. It's a, it's a training camp. I think they could have done without it. Uh, and all you would need is, is maybe one positive case to, to bring back or or restrictions to come into force over the next week that, that might quarantine anyone that's been in Dubai. I think uh, it fluctuates so quickly that you, you really put yourself at risk and I think then it, it could put the entire league in, in jeopardy. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we all agree on that Dubai situation. Um, but again, uh, you know, we wait for clarification on that, Tam. But uh, nevertheless, you know, when you've got a situation, can, can you imagine? Can you imagine they call the league <laughs> this season again? I mean, 19 points is, is more than enough, Tom. I don't think we could get into an argument for nine, 19 oh, no. points to you. No, I, I, listen, I think the, the league's gone anyway. I think Rangers will win it whether, whether the league is called early or they're going to play the league. But it always leaves that sour taste. It was the same with Rangers last, last, last time. You know, Celtic were what, 11 points, 13 points clear. And the uh, Rangers fans still held out hope that they could come back and win the league. So there'll still be that little bit of debate about it, but I don't think now. I don't think with the vaccine, as you said, if the vaccine around the corner, hopefully that gets into everybody um, by this by the next couple of months, and uh, we can go on with the league and finish it and get back to normality because it's torture, isn't it? You know, we're back in lockdown again. It's really it's terrible for people's mental health. Um, January is a bad enough month as it is, I think. So listen, let's just hope this vaccine gets rolled out and everybody gets a dose of it that needs it, and we can get back to normal life again. Fingers crossed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, try not to focus too much on the vaccine, Tam, because we do have flat earthers yeah. who want to absolutely batter you for suggesting a vaccine in the first <laughs> place. I just, just thought I'd mention that to you. Uh, the other thing I'm going to say now is, and, and more often than not, we'll give you an opinion on football, uh, off-the-field activities. We are uh, continually on this programme um, trying to uh, appeal to thoroughly decent people who love their football and are decent in their opinion. And I think 99% of the time we do indeed have a football family that love their teams and give us intelligent views. Uh, I've got no qualms whatsoever with dealing with other issues which are unsavoury as well. And the next one comes into that category. Um, and, and there's no point in going about what about it here because, you know, the, the behaviour of some people who attach themselves to football uh, at times leaves a lot to be desired. Um, Celtic have released a statement. Um, they're wanting an investigation, and this has just come out. They want an investigation into Rangers fans who are chanting pedo at the Celtic players coming off the bus ahead of the game at Ibrox. Uh, a spokesperson for Celtic says... The sectarian abuse suffered by our players and staff is completely unacceptable. We have raised this issue with Police Scotland and they have confirmed they are investigating the matter. Clearly, we would, we would all hope that all efforts are made to identify those responsible and for all appropriate action to be taken. Police Scotland's Superintendent Stevie Dolan has said we can confirm that an investigation is ongoing into abusive comments and singing around the time of the Celtic team coach arriving at Ibrox prior to the match on Saturday the 2nd of January. This is an active inquiry and no arrests have been made at this stage. Um, so that news is just out. I mean, I have actually witnessed the video. I don't know why the police don't arrest them there and then, Ruffy. It's not as if you have to wait to see video evidence of somebody behaving like a moron and breaking the law. It's not as if you have to be enlightened of what the law is. 
it's abundantly clear to everyone. Um, you know, and, and I'm reading some people, what about a brigade giving it, what about the abuse to, to near Beton's wife and things like that? Well, you know, bad behavior, behavior that is abusive and breaks the law, whether it's on social media or whether it's standing outside Ibrox towards players coming off uh, the bus, if it's breaking the law, the police should take action. The one at the bus, for me, beggars belief because I think the police should arrest them there and then. Yeah, I, I think we've, we've all discussed how, how difficult it is when an actual match is going ahead and there's a large crowd in to, to go in and identify five or six people and haul them out and, and in front of seven or eight thousand. I, I get where the police are coming with that one and they say, well, we, we react maybe three or four days later, then we go and get them. You know, but in this particular instance, you know, this would have been an ideal opportunity just to prove to everybody else round about that this is what's going to happen to you if you if it's there now. You know, you just get arrested and you get taken away. If somebody's walking down Sucky Hall Street and they're filing an abusive lie means the police just walk up and put cuffs on them and you're huckled away, you know. So why are football supporters any different for anybody else? If it's there and then and it's a positive, do it, you know, make examples of them. Uh, and that's the only way we're going to stop it. Alison, uh, I mean, I know this is my own personal opinion on this. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm an ambassador for show racism, the red card, and there's, and there's also been, um, I think, you know, over the course of this year that we've just witnessed in 2020, uh, a condemnation of abuse that's filed towards the treatment of women. There's been condemnation towards the treatment of black people. Um, there's been condemnation of racism right across the board for black sports people as well. I think our biggest problem that remains in Scotland is a sectarian one. And I think a lot of people are continually scared to deal with that issue, uh, but it hasn't gone away. And I think it's more of a problem in Scotland than some of the other issues. Not that that should in any way belittle the need to fight them equally on all fronts, but I think our biggest problem still remains sectarianism. It's been a poison for, for decades here. I don't think it's it's ever properly been addressed, and I certainly don't think it's ever been close to being eliminated. But I think some of the comments that we saw and, and the, the jeering that we saw at the weekend, it, it's morally reprehensible. I think you have to take action. I think Celtic are quite right to release a statement and to invite the police to get involved in it, because I think it's only with a heavy hand that you're going to alter the behaviour. And for the vast majority of football fans, for the vast majority who are Rangers fans and Celtic fans, you'll go to the game, you'll support your team. Tam touched on it five minutes ago. There might be banter between pals, between within families who support different different clubs, but, but there's a line that the minority cross. And I think we've tried education. You've tried to explain why it's unacceptable. I think sometimes it just has to be dealt with quite with quite a heavy hand. You have to have a fine. I agree with you. I think if the police are witness to that, it raises the question why you don't deal with it when it's right in front of you. In, in any other area of the city, in, in any other environment, there would be an immediate retribution from from the police and from the authorities, and I don't think that that footballers should be any different. If you if you are expected to to take that kind of abuse, then I think you're entitled to ask where the protection is from the the officers that are there. Well, there's uh, an investigation. We'll wait to see what the outcome is on that yeah. one. But there's no doubt it's an ongoing problem. Something that I think um, more than a few um, MSPs and MPs would do well to uh, pick up the baton on it once again, because it's a problem that's not going away. I think some people are actually trying to hide behind other issues, which seem to be, um, you know, at this moment uh, trendy to to you know pitch yourself to. Um, but there's certainly an area which I think needs to be addressed. Education is the key, believe me. Um, OK, um, football issues. Um, we looked at some of the scores we we're talking about. Uh, Hibs, um, Aberdeen against Dundee United. Thank God I didn't tape that one, Tom. Um, uh, again, nil-nil. Uh, this is an Aberdeen side that think they can split Celtic and Rangers. I don't see it. No, no chance. No chance, Peter. I don't think they're good enough this season. Um, I think they're dropping too many points against teams that they usually beat. You know, Aberdeen have been brilliant the last three, four, five years of beating the teams outside the Celtic Rangers. You know, they've been great at it, and that's why they finished third every season. So, um, no, I, I think the Dundee.
he probably deserved to win the game. I watched the highlights, if there was any. And Long Shankman was unlucky a couple of times. Not to score. He looked the best player in the park for me, just judging by the highlights. So I think Dundee United are just eking their way into that top six. I don't think they're great to watch, but they're very solid at the back. They're picking up points and they, they'll probably just scrape into that top six Dundee United. But I still feel that they've got the players and the personnel there to, to play better football. I mean, they're, they're, they're tight to beat under Mickey Mellon, but they don't, they're not expansive enough to go and try and break teams down and maybe the next season you'll see that, but I think that they'll scrape into the top six. I think Aberdeen, you know, judging by the way Hibs are going at the minute, I think they'll they'll be in third still because Hibs any the consistency about them over the last few weeks. Funny you saying that, Tam. Yeah. What about uh, Lauren Shanklin? He's ninety two goals in three seasons, but only three in the top flight. Is he being found out at this level? Uh, no, I don't think he is, Peter. I think that he's playing in a team that is just dire to watch. I think they're set up not to lose goals, they're not set up to create and score goals, and I think as a striker. You, know, you want to be in a team with a manager who's on the front foot, who wants to go and attack and, be in, and, and create chances and score goals. And Mickey Mellon's doing it the other way. He's trying to be hard to beat. Listen, I have no problem with that. It's his first season back up in, in the top flight. You know, he wants to be safe, doesn't want to be down near about the bottom. He wants to try and get in the mid-table, and that's fine. But as a striker, you know, it's really, really it's poor for, for a striker. You don't get a lot of chances. And Shankland was unlucky at the weekend. You know, he hurt the bar with a great effort, but he'd done it all himself. He's having to he score goals and do things himself because he's not getting any service. The same way, it's the same with Nicky Clark, and uh, you know it's the same with other strikers at the club. So I, I don't think that Shankland's playing in a team that's inducive to scoring goals. So I'd hold fire on say that he's a failure at the top flight. To be honest. Yeah. Okay. Um, we will hold fire till the end of the season. Um, uh, Ruffy, uh, we talked about a, a really good goalkeeper at the the top of the program. What did you make of Danny Rogers for the equaliser? Uh, oh, Kelly one, St Mirren one. I mean that was an absolute howler, pushing over the bar. Yeah, I know, but it's another one when we 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 don't all like VAR, but VAR might have been the the way to get out of that one. He he was a hundred percent sure, you know, and every goalkeeper does it. They know they're behind the line, so they stick their hands out, you know, and hope that the ball uh, looks more uh, not over the line than than not. But it's a massive shout from referee and linesman to get that one hundred percent right. That's another one. You know, I think uh, you, you would like to see more clearly. It is a howler. It's a howler for him because he has now fallen into the category that he doesn't make saves either in that Kilmarnock side. And it, it, he's, he's quite a culprit in a lot of the games. He's not winning games, he's losing games, which is a shame because if he's 100% sure that ball wasn't over the line, it's a bit of an injustice, really. But you're right. He had umpteen options, put it over the bar, punch it, do whatever you want. But... He elected to catch it, and and he was sure that uh, it wasn't over. The whole ball wasn't over the line. It's a whole ball one for me. Uh, it didn't look the whole ball over the line, you know. So it's a tough one to shout without the VAR. Alec like Dyer said after the game that it was over the line. He said it in sport. Well, he know? Scene, he said it was a goal. I don't know. Maybe he well, seen that... another angle. Well, I watched all the <laughs> sports scene ones. I watched all the sports yeah. scene ones, and they weren't conclusive either. No. Maybe Kelly TV has a goal like technology. I think the consensus was it was over the line. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but was it completely <laughs> over the line? Yeah, <laughs> completely, Alan. Not just three quarters. And the other oh. thing is, is Ruffy calls for VAR, um, where the rest of the UK wants to take VR and kick it right into the North Sea. Um, but nevertheless, I understand where you're coming from, Ruffy, on that one. Um, listen, um, I don't know about you, we all seem... Absolutely 100% confident Rangers are going to win the league. But I don't know at the bottom. I can't pick who's going down. Look at the Premiership table, Ali. It's mightily difficult. It could be, is there an appointment of a Motherwell manager that saves them? Ross County starting to play under uh, Yogi Hughes. Hamilton responding to Brian Rice. Um, it's such a difficult one to call, Ali. Yeah, you look at the difference there between St Mirren and Ross County and it's five points is all that's in it. I know there's a a few different games in hand and whatnot still to be played, but I, I just think you could go on a run where you lose a game or lose two games or the converse, you win one or two and you're you're switching places quite rapidly. You're either shooting up or, or falling down, but I think it's very, very difficult to call at the minute. And I, and I go back to the point I made about Motherwell and the uncertainty. 
about these points because when you look at the league table, it can have such a, a different look to it if you know exactly where those points are going to go or if you're going to have to play the games again. I think it's unfair to the teams involved to allow that to, mm. to dither yeah. too long. I think you have to make a decision one way or another so that people know exactly where they are because when it's so tight, it just is huge consequences for clubs. But in terms of how they're playing just now, I think... Motherwell are, are truly in it. I think they're definitely in a relegation battle. Ross County get an immediate lift there with, with John Hughes at the weekend. Uh, Hamilton look all of a sudden as though they've, they've hit a wee purple patch. I know they lost to Celtic in between that, but uh, they've picked up points and, and very, very important points that I think just might be the catalyst for them to, to go on a wee run. So it'd be impossible to call at the minute. Peter. Yep, uh, unless, unless, of course, you're Ruffy, Tom. He's still going with Ross County to go. He is. No, no, I've no, no, changed my oh, mind. I've oh. changed my mind a wee bit since Yogi's there. I quite like Yogi. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Yogi's. I wouldn't like to see him getting relegated. So maybe yeah. I'll change my mind on that one. I think, Peter, oh, that's Peter good. I think as my mother will, my mother will as well. They've got three of the top players out of contract in the summer Campbell, Gallagher, and O'Donnell. I think O'Donnell's out of contract in January. So, yes. That is that, that's your three best players, and that could that's, that could be a big saying in them staying up, and getting them tied down, or, or, or letting them go, or selling them. It's funny, forgive me for this, Tam, but because um, obviously Alison and I, um, you know, look at it from a journalistic point of view. The minute uh, Ruffy says, "No, no, I quite like Yogi. I've changed my mind," we automatically thought Ruff didn't like Kettlewell. Um, that's yes. I mean, that, that's just that's just the way our mind operated there. As soon as he opened his gob uh, on that one, but nevertheless, well, uh, must be the manager. Well, must be the manager. Well, exactly. There are lots of Rangers fans who are, are posting messages, um, uh, obviously saying they're appalled at the conduct of uh, some of these so-called supporters outside Ibrox, uh, and really, um, it's heartening to, to hear that. Not because Rangers fans need to justify their decency. Um, you know, there's you know, lots of messages we're getting from people condemning the behaviour of these morons. You know, and nobody needs to be convinced in this programme of the thoroughly decent supporters, the majority of decent supporters right across Scottish football. And we have them on this programme regularly. So, um, you know, it's nice to see uh, lots of fans condemning their behaviour. There are people who are... Um, what I call the Whataboutery Brigade, who don't want to deal with the issue and want to try and highlight others' moronic behaviour, whether it's somebody who claims to be a Celtic fan, a Rangers fan, or Hibs or Hearts, is moronic behaviour. These people do it in their everyday life and they think it's acceptable. Uh, the unfortunate thing for us is they use football as a platform for their behaviour. Um, and, and we can only highlight it if a news item comes out. So, um, But there are lots of thoroughly decent fans right across the board who are condemning such behaviour. It is a poison in our society. Um, team of the week, surely, surely it's 1-11 to 11 for Gabriel Antoniazzi. Surely it's 1-11 to 11, uh, over the Rangers side. Or have uh, other players sneaked in? Alan McGregor made two world-class saves to help Rangers win the old firm. And if they do win the league, they can thank him more than anyone else. Lee Hodson was high-flying to open the scoring for Hamilton Ackies. Mark Reynolds impressed against his old club and ensured United kept a clean sheet. John Guthrie scored, assisted and did not concede. What more could you want from the Livy defender? Josh Mullin was a cue for Livingston and struck first at Easter Road. Ross Callaghan has been Aki's best player all campaign and he scored and assisted again in the Lanarkshire derby. Stephen Kelly stood out for Canty in the middle as he kept things ticking over. Ben Sterling played in midfield and battled to make sure Aki's hammered rivals Motherwell. Yanis Hadji only came on at half-time, but his ball retention allowed the Jers to move up the park and halt Celtic's press. Scott Robinson was everywhere on Saturday, and his determination and skill to score his goal was outstanding. Danny Whitehall made it two goals in two games with a towering header from the big forward. That's not a bad side, Tam. Three Yankees players in it. Never thought we'd see that. Yeah, no, I was going to say that. It's only... You know, two two Rangers players, no Celtic players. I don't see that very often in the, the team of the week, but I think he's he's bang on there. I was like, maybe put Effie Ambrose in. Big Effie had a cigar at the Hamlet against Hibs at the weekend. So maybe put Big yeah. Effie in. But apart from that, I think his team is bang on. Well done, Gabs. Good start to the year, son. Yeah, great start. No Hibs players. Brilliant start. Well done, Gabs. <laughs> um... <laughs> well, complaints there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, listen, I'll tell you, we'll be complaining now because Alison. 
Uh, you know better than anyone, Alison, there's nothing more annoying and nauseating than someone who has that kind of an arrogant streak about them, you know, poncing about with the chest out as if, you know, the predictor was going to be a, an absolute foregone conclusion. But have a look, Ali, at the predictor. Things have changed dramatically uh, over the festive period. Ruffy, it's 1-8-2, 1-8-2, and look who's trailing in third place, Ruffy. He's behind us as we I've been off the boil. The same as Hibs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, both I, don't know which, I don't know which restaurant we're going to pick, Ruffy, but it's looking good for his son. Oh, well, let's lockdown. hope some of the good ones Please reopen. Please hope the lockdowns continues then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you the just uh, eat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It can change. It's like shares. They can go up as well as downtown. Believe me, it's a long way to go. Um, although, Ham, if we were 19 points ahead, I'd say there was no way back, Tam. It's as simple as that, but we're not. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, listen, uh, just a wee word on this, Rafi. I think we're, it's changing as we go on. I'm going to get uh, all you guys to give us your thoughts on this, but... Ronaldo scored a couple of goals for Juventus at the weekend. He's now the second top goal scorer of all time. Uh, Joseph Bican with 805. Ronaldo ahead of Pele now. Romario, Gerd Müller and Lionel Messi. Um, I still think maybe uh, as his career gets to the tail end and he finally decides to wind down, which could be another two or three years, Maybe we'll have to reassess Ronaldo's place yep. in history as the greatest footballer of all time. Yeah, I think we may have to reassess it in the next year. We'll get some massive tournaments coming up. We've got the Euros obviously coming up and then a World Cup. And who's to say he's not going to grab the two tournaments by the scruff of the neck as he's done it on numerous occasions with that Portuguese side. So no, it, it, I mean, it's just the way the, the guy just obviously looks after himself and the way he, he promotes the game so much. And yeah, right there, you know, I, I think he's a massive big tournament away for maybe jumping a few people and uh, making him the number one. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, Alison, when you uh, look back over the last month and sadly we lost one of the greatest players of all time in Diego Maradona. Um, I mean, I, I have Ronaldo and Messi in my top five footballers of all time. Um, but I still have them behind Pele and Maradona. Am I being unkind to both of them, especially Ronaldo? I think the the Maradona one and Pele to a certain extent too is just what they do it for their for their countries at major tournaments. I think Maradona single handedly delivered a World Cup for Argentina. Uh, I think he also going to unfancied clubs like to go to Napoli and and win a title and and really be the catalyst to go and bring success to a club. I think he was an outstanding footballer. I'm not sure how easy it is or how fair it is to compare across different eras, but what would stand out for me when you talk about Ronaldo is the sheer professionalism in terms of looking after himself and what he would really be just now is the he would epitomise the modern athlete, I think, in terms of his approach to, to his career and just the nutritional aspect of it, the physicality of it, the athleticism that is now is married to a very clear natural skill. Maybe it's a generational thing because, Tam, uh, believe me, uh, about maybe 20 years ago, people were talking about the first Ronaldo as one of the greatest mm. of all time, had he not picked up the injuries. Not, not, not a great athlete, the, the first Ronaldo, um, but... I think the second Ronaldo, well, the Portuguese... At, at, the tail end, at the tail end of his career, Tam, he wasn't a great athlete. Yeah. Because basically he picked up that many injuries and then he just he put on weight. But at the start, when yeah. he was a young boy, he was a machine. Yeah. No, listen, I think, I think Cristiano Ronaldo could play to his 45. Honestly, I think he could stretch out. You know, people always say, oh, 35, you're finished. You know, I think he can play 40, 41, 42, and then he can go and play, maybe, maybe not Serie A level. Maybe, maybe he could go to a lesser league and still banging goals and play his 44, 45 because he's in some shape. You know, and I think he can just keep going for, for, a, for a long, long time yet. So I think that, I think he'll beat that top goal scorer. I think he'll beat that. I think he's like 50 odd goals behind. I think he'll, he'll end up the, the greatest goal scorer of all time. 
Yeah, okay, uh, two or three things I want to quickly finish with before we, we end the programme. Uh, one decent person um, that I am so delighted he's back at uh, Dun uh, not Dundee United, back at Manchester United, uh, Ruffy, is Darren Fletcher. We've had him on the programme. Uh, I just think he's, he's got the DNA of Manchester United running through his yeah. blood. He's going back as a coach. Yeah, I think the, de the destiny of, of him is to be a top manager. I think he's going about it the right way. You know, he, he, he's really... You know, picking and choosing what he's going to be doing. He did a wee bit of media there. Now he's been the opportunity to go in there and work with <coughs> a top top club. You know, with academy that speaks for itself. So, no, I think again he's fallen into the category of, of at the right time to become a top top manager. But we'll have to wait and see where that is going to be. Yeah, great to see him back there um, at Manchester United. Um, listen, if you think uh, if you think managers uh, can be under severe pressure up here, what about down south, Tam? About you know six weeks ago, they were talking about Chelsea possibly winning the league. Frank Lampard, mm. a genius. Now it looks as if they're calling for his head. Yep, yeah, they, they spent a fortune as well. I think they spent over two hundred million. Um, they have got so many players, and Man City absolutely scalped them. Man City were brilliant in the first half yesterday. Uh, watched the game as as good a team as good a performance as I've seen all season. You know, scudded them, and Chelsea. You know, they're in they're in free fall. I think they're sitting in eighth place at the minute, and that is not where they expected to be in the money that they've spent. So I think Lampard's got to start getting a few results, or else he's been a sugarly nil. Yeah, there's two or three uh, names I want to mention, Ruffy, because we're back on the 4th of January. We had a, a programme on the second previewing the Old Firm game, but I think it would be remiss of me, and I'm, I'm delighted that Neil Gray and a few others have mentioned. You know, people that I think we should mention in the first program, first full program back, Ruffy. And one of them was Jim McLean, um, who sadly passed away. You know, Ruffy, you played in his era. He was an unbelievable manager. Um, lots of people uh, of an older generation would have seen him as a player, but he certainly made his mark as a coach to win the league, to be cheated, in my opinion, out of a European Cup final place um, by a rogue referee. And of course, to get the team to the UEFA Cup final, will we ever see his like again? He was he was one of the top Scottish football managers, Ruffy. Yeah, you can't take anything away from him on football and wise, you know, to 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 manage a team like Dundee United and have a nucleus of guys from Dundee at the time and take them to where they were. Uh, you'll hear all the stories of what it was like away from the football park. Uh, <laughs> you have to take that with a, a pinch of salt because the players that played with him will tell you that there was some good times and bad times, like like all good managers, but his record itself, the league wins, you know, Dundee United when Celtic Rangers were flying, the, the European runs will never be seen again at Dundee United, and he was the, he was the main man, you know, that uh, brought all that to Dundee. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you say Celtic and Rangers. <laughs> Aberdeen were better than that, than both those sides at that time as well. Uh, Ruffy, uh, you're at the heart of, sadly, legends that have passed away. Tommy Doherty, not only as a manager, I mean, he's a good player, but as a manager, uh, the highlight for him was um, Manchester United. Yeah, I had an earlier uh, earlier contact with him. Uh, the, the day we won the, the League Cup in 1971 was the Saturday. On the, on the Monday, him and Terry Neal came into Patrick Thistle to buy me for Hull City. Uh, it was turned down uh, the next week. He gave me my first introduction to the Scotland's full squad with Kenny Dalglish. Two who's got brought into the full squad to play Belgium up in Aberdeen. Uh, I don't think they both of us played, but no, I've got a lot to say about him as well. Old school, loved being about him. You know, what a, a character, you know, positive. To, as soon as he walked into your company, it was positiveness all the way, even in the dressing room, even when you were playing. Such an enthusiastic guy, and, and, and guys like that are missing it. You know, there's not enough people like him in the game. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. We'll try to discuss as much as possible right across Premiership legends that have passed away, sadly. Uh, and, of course, um, at the top of the programme, uh, the main point was that Rangers with a 19-point lead at the top of the table uh, look as if they are in a position where uh, the league is going to be won by Rangers and Stephen, manager, uh, Stephen Gerrard as the manager. Lots of people have been arguing, debating it. Um, we think it's done and dusted. You might think otherwise. The uh, argument over the future of Neil Lennon, you can give us your thoughts on that tomorrow. We'll be back to discuss that. Uh, one that was uh, predominant um, over the course of the 
uh, the weekend, Alice, and I think it deserves special mention, is uh, the brilliant tributes that were paid to the 66 Rangers fans who sadly lost their life in the 50th anniversary of that uh, disaster uh, on the 2nd of January 1971. It puts football in perspective, and I think from both halves of the city, um, it was an emotional tribute, uh, Alison. Yeah, actually, I, I felt sorry for the club that they, they couldn't mark it in the way they wanted to, just because of obviously the, the COVID restrictions. But I thought that the documentary about the, the disaster was particularly poignant. And I also thought it was a nice touch to have the, the players and the, the current staff just read out the list of names and, and to be sure that they've not been forgotten about, that they were they were very much in the minds of, of those who are part of the modern day club. Yep, absolutely well said. Um, okay, uh, thanks very much to all of you for all your messages across our social media. Don't forget, you can like, share and follow on our Facebook. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and, of course, uh, you can join us on our Twitter as well where you can watch the programme. And if you download the app, you can get all the information right across uh, not only UK football, European and world football and the PLZ Soccer app. Thanks to Ruffy. Thanks to Tam McManus. Thank you very much to Alison McConnell. Join us if you can tomorrow when uh, Tam Cowan will be with Darren Jackson, myself and Ruffy uh, from 4 o'clock live. Thanks for watching. Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit 